Greetings, dear motorsportsmen, and I'm really happy to welcome you on the fastest and the sharpest review of Spanish GP 2023. Let's start! But before we start, I want to talk about tire testing, which took place during FP1 and FP2. And the thing is, I have a problem with it. Let me explain myself. In first Pirelli press release, I found an interesting quote, that those new compounds will become more resistant. And I actually have problems with it, because I suppose that current compounds are already way too resistant. Let me explain myself. In Gida, Piastri managed to cover the whole racing distance on C2. In Melbourne, Guan Yu Zhou covered 55 out of 58 laps on C2. In Baku, Akon and Hülkenberg covered the whole racing distance on C3, which was softs today, by the way. In Miami, Norris and Piastri again covered pretty much all the distance on C2. Those C2 and C3 compounds are already way too resistant. And at the same time, in Miami, C4 just blew up in 4 laps. In Baku, C4 started melting at around 7 or 8 laps. So it's obvious that C4 and C5 lack resistance. But starting from C3 and downwards, the compounds are too resistant. I highly doubt that we will ever see C0, which was announced for this season. So the whole situation with making tires more resistant bothers me. But in the latest release, Pirelli actually said that new construction has no impact on technical parameters of the tires. So I don't really know what to expect. Tell me your thoughts about it. And also Pirelli told us that Barcelona is the perfect test track, but I want to rephrase it a little bit. Barcelona was the perfect test track. Let's compare new old layout with previous layout with the chicane. We see a low speed section of two corners. Down here we see a low speed corner here and turn 10 used to have lower speeds but now we can call it like semi low speed corner somewhere in between low speed and medium speed corner. Then we have a bunch of medium speed corners like turn 1, turn 4, turn 7, turn 12 and turn 13. And also we have a bunch of high speed corners. Pretty much the whole section started from turn 2 all the way through the turn 3, then turn 9 and turn 16 is also a high speed corner. And if we finish it up with reasonable amount of straight line, we indeed see a perfectly balanced track. But now we move to current layout and it changes the whole balance. We get rid of the slowest part, also we get rid of this medium speed corner and in exchange we receive just one high speed corner. And from now on this track is not balanced. It looks like Jida in terms of corner mixture. High speed corners start to dominate and we have only one and a half low speed corner left. So this track is not perfect for testing now. But on the other side, the track is good for racing now. Because Barcelona used to have a reputation of a track with low amount of overtakes. Not like Monaco, of course, but still close to it. But the main problem was the previous rule set. The main problem was a dirty air. The main overtaking opportunity in Barcelona is turn 1. But the braking zone here is not hard enough because it finishes with a medium speed corner. If this corner had lower speed, the braking here would be even harder, which will create more overtakes. The second main braking zone is actually hard enough, but the straight before it is too short. As I told you, the main problem was dirty air because both those straights had a high speed corner before them and cars just couldn't follow each other through it. And it was the main reason why Barcelona didn't have overtakes. In fact, even in previous year with the new rule set, this problem was pretty much solved. But I still like the new old layout, because now the entrance speed to the straight is even higher in terms of driving track became a bit easier, so this is pretty much it for track changes. Now we move towards Q1, and Q1 was the most interesting session in qualifying, because it started with a little drizzle all over the track, which resulted in a few drifts, in a red flag, and as track was drying out, the evolution was pretty impressive. But what's even more impressive is actual results. We see Charles Leclerc 
P19. Oh my god. But we will break down his failed lap in depth. We also see Sergio Perez barely even make it out of Q1. Max Verstappen on P9, but Max Verstappen was the only driver who didn't even bother himself with staying on track towards the end of the session. That's why we see Lewis Hamilton topping the chart and that's why we see such a mixed grid as a whole. So what happened to Charles Leclerc? To find it out, we'll compare his lap with Carlos Sainz's lap. Both laps are from the end of the session, so the conditions are pretty similar. And for the first time of such an analysis, I see Charles Leclerc actually making a better exit of the last corner than the driver we compare him to, which is already pretty interesting. But we move forward to the start-finish straight. We see speeds close the gap between each other and actually towards the end of the straight Carlos Sainz was already faster. So I assume that he had a lower downforce setup, which actually makes his whole lap even more impressive. And the next pretty unregular thing is that Charles Leclerc is braking earlier than Carlos Sainz. Yes, the difference is not huge, but it's still quite meaningful. And the other thing I noticed is difference in downshifting. If Charles Leclerc starts downshifting as soon as he gets on the brakes, he brakes and then immediately starts to downshift through the gears, Sainz starts braking, that he waits for a moment and only then he starts to downshift. And now check the difference in lines. You might notice that Carlos Sainz was a bit wider on the exit, making a wider line, which results in this point. And at this point his car is already rotated better. And also we see that he managed to bring more speed with him during the braking. Charles used his two-pedal technique as usual. And let's go forward. Again a noticeable difference. Charles had more speed out of the corner, so he has to brake with two pedals technique again. And Sainz will do just a tiny tiny lift off the throttle. And here is an interesting point I want to talk about. You see telemetry shows that Carlos Sainz is braking, but it has zero influence over his speed. That means that this telemetry triggers even from, I don't know, 1%, half percent pushing the brakes, which is a shame actually. But let's go forward. We move forward this long turn 3 and here is the braking zone for turn 4 and also it is an end of the first sector. And we see Carlos Sainz being a bit faster than Charles. We actually do not see this on the screenshot. But the fact is the real border between sectors lies somewhere here. We see again Carlos Sainz will break later than Charles Leclerc. That's why we see difference in times but do not see difference in actual video. But now I want you to check the walk with the steering wheel. Wheel. I have highlighted this steering wheel walk in my video about Charles Leclerc driving style. Charles is pretty one-dimensional with his steering wheel. He just turns it, holds it in one angle and he's planning to do the whole walk with his pedals. While Carlos Sainz is way more progressive. He starts turning his wheel at the same moment, but his movement is more progressive. He starts with lesser angle and then he just progresses towards bigger and bigger angle. And this walk actually pays dividends, at least in Barcelona, because he is every time faster during corner entrance. And that's where he pretty much has all his gains. We see Charles is able to accelerate earlier but it has no difference on the exit speed. And we are already in turn 5, one of the hardest turns in Barcelona. First of all, they now have these markers, which they didn't have previously, so it was hard to judge the breaking point. The second thing, the corner is pretty blind and it is actually pretty slow, but when you are on the track, you can underestimate how slow this corner is. And right now we see a huge difference in breaking points. Again, Sainz is breaking later. And from this difference, I actually assume that his brake bias is way, way more front heavy, which allows him a better braking performance and which actually explains the difference in steering wheel work. Right here, it's pretty noticeable. Charles already has 
full angle and science will continue to add the steering angle. You see? And they actually both miss their apexes, but Charles had a bigger miss of the apex, which costed him quite a lot. And from here, the gap between Sainz and Leclerc will start to build up. They go towards the next turn and we see them breaking at exact same moment. But Carlos is already, I don't know, one, one and a half car lengths ahead of Charles, so he again breaks later. He trail breaks, which is a pretty logical thing to do in this exact corner, considering the whole configuration. And we see Charles going off the brakes earlier, but as I told you already, trail braking here is way more appropriate. They go to the next corner. In here I was pretty surprised that they both lifted the throttle, that they both was using the brakes. But they go on. And here is the finish of the second sector. We see a huge difference, two and a half tenths of a second. We see this difference in the video. And let's drag Charles Leclerc towards Carlos Sainz. We drag him forward and this corner is the only corner when Carlos actually started to break a bit earlier than Charles. But otherwise, the, pre the picture will be pretty similar. And again, I want to highlight a huge difference in minimal speed. Carlos Sainz is able to carry higher speed throughout the whole circuit. And here we see a small correction from Carlos, but it looks like a correction of an understeer, not an oversteer. And this fact fits the picture perfectly. I assume that Carlos has more understeer balance with his setup, which allows him to be just more stable with this car. Right here Charles is already behind and he will not touch the apex, which is quite crucial through this corner actually. And here we see the only corner on the track where Charles was faster. We see a higher speed throughout the corner, so it is basically the only corner where he was actually quicker than Carlos. But it was not enough to cope up with him, so let's drag Charles forward once more and compare the last two high-speed corners. We see them lifting. And here I'm surprised once again, because Mercedes drivers didn't push brakes through this corner. Carlos will brake way later, he will trail brake through this fast corner, which is a pretty logical thing to do. And the whole picture with Carlos Sainz trail braking more than Charles looks quite strange, because Charles Leclerc is a fan of trail braking. I actually assume that he was way too uncomfortable with his car, and this is basically the main reason. So, the last turn. Yes, Charles will have a better exit out of this turn, as we we'll see with the speed. But Science was able to carry more speed throughout the corner, which is more viable in this particular situation. And again, we see Carlos winning actually more than 3 tenths of a second in the last sector, which resulted in a huge difference. My personal hypothesis is that Leclerc was just uncomfortable with track conditions. He is actually pretty slow during wet conditions. And I suppose that as soon as the rain started, he felt himself uncomfortable. His balance is clearly more oversteer than Carlos's balance and the whole situation just messed up. Now we move forward towards Q2, results of Q2. George Russell had a contact with Lewis Hamilton on his last lap, but as I told you already in shorts video, I suppose that it actually didn't influence his lap time and he still was not able to outperform Lewis Hamilton, who had only first attempt. So a clear win for Lewis and actually I noticed that a lot of people tend to assume that in this season George is faster than Lewis in qualifications, but I do not know where it came from, because as for now, the qualifying score between them is 4-3 in favor of Lewis. If we add sprint shootout from Baku to it, the score is 4-4 between Hamilton and Russell. But maybe two races ago I heard some awful scores like 3-1, 4-1. And I do not know where it comes from. I guess people just try to manipulate the numbers 
just a little bit. Sergio Perez on the fastest car is failing the second qualifying in a row. And despite his mistake, he was actually able to make a second attempt and this attempt was still awful. And just for context, this time of Max Verstappen was his first attempt. He just abandoned his lap during his second attempt and he is still topping the leaderboard. Now let's break down the difference between Hamilton and Russell and we see that Russell was slower than Lewis for the whole session. But let's compare these two laps, they seem to be the closest ones. And we see a significant telemetry difference. Russell tended to have a higher top speed, perfect picture in here, and I assume that he had just a lower downforce setup, because Lewis was clearly faster through high speed corners, here, here, and as usual Lewis was gaining under the braking, because Lewis Hamilton is a late breaker, here is the perfect example. But the key thing really is that despite braking later, Lewis managed to have a higher minimum speed through the corner and still somehow have a better exit of the corner. So yeah, Russell's car was all over the place, he didn't feel himself in touch with it, or maybe Lewis just found this magic connection. But this qualifying session is actually the first qualifying session with such difference between Lewis and George. And speaking of Lewis, in Q3 he dropped the hammer, only P5. As a result, strong performance from Carl Sainz, we can actually call him a real winner of the qualification, because Max Verstappen is just out of the equation, basically. He gaps everyone with half a second, and then we see four drivers being within one tenth of a second. Also pretty astonishing results for London Norris and Pierre Gasly. Lance Stroll finally outqualified Fernando Alonso, which also was a surprise, and quite a strong performance of Nico Hülkenberg, dragging Haas in Q3 and actually not being last in there. So the whole grid was pretty messed up, which should lead us to an interesting race. And let's move to it. Lance Stroll had a perfect race start, he just capitalized on collision between Hamilton and Norris. Exceptional start for George Russell, 5 positions gained. Also strong starts from Guan Yu Zhou, Yuki Tsunoda and Kevin Magnussen. Sainz decided to back off from trying to get P1, but we have already discussed it in short video. And we see that most of the drivers choose soft for starts. This is pretty much it. Now, let's move on to strategy review. Everyone was doing two stops, but actually the whole pack of leaders could go one stop easily. It was George Russell who started this domino effect. He pitted first, pretty much denying Paris with any chances of possible overcut, and his pace from lap 45 to lap 50 was so good that it became clear that he will catch up with Sergio, that he will pass through him easily, and also he started even undercutting Hamilton. So both Hamilton and Paris had to make their own pit stops, and in the end Verstappen just had a free pit stop. But if Russell didn't start at it, we actually could saw a solid one-stop race from first four drivers. And here is where Ferrari lost all the chances with Carl Sainz, because from lap 15 all the way to lap 24 and 25, soft tires still didn't die. Because, as I told you in the beginning, it is C3, they are pretty durable, they had the pace, and Ferrari just didn't use all this pace, putting themselves in a huge disadvantage, and then when Russell and Hamilton made the pit stop, Science was just an easy target for them. And the only outlier is Guan Yu Zhou. He pitted early, he also denied a huge portion of soft tire life. He could actually also try to go one stop, but he still managed to put on a solid performance. P9 and 2 points for the team. And now let's talk about Aston Martin. I see pretty much all the fans being too focused on the end results. Everyone says that Stroll is too slow, but is it really a case? Is it really a truth? Let's find out. And let's compare his tempo with Fernando Alonso. And we will actually see that for the first 7 laps he was 
pretty, pretty faster. Yes, you may argue that Alonso had some traffic, he had to make his overtake, but it was still the case. Then, for the remaining stint, the temp was quite similar. Then, Aston Martin made an early pit stop for Lance Stroll, and we have already discussed that it was a disadvantage in this race. But still, Lance managed to put on quite a strong tempo. We see that out of the box he was actually faster than Fernando out of the box. So even the second stint we can put in advantage for Lance Stroll. And the only thing that he really lost was the third stint. But again, the difference in tires was 10 laps. It is a huge difference. So yeah, Alonso was a bit showing himself off with Team Radio. We just cheering the fans even before the finish line. But Stroll actually showed himself strong during the whole weekend. He outqualified Fernando. He had a good race start. And Lance Stroll is usually a good starter. And he had a solid pace. I cannot see, considering all the circumstances, that he was slower than Fernando during the race. So the whole Lance Stroll criticism is overwhelmed. At least if we look at the last race. Just two weekends, just one week basically. And Sergio Perez lost all his hope for championship. The gap is more than 50 points. Press F and move forward. The main goal for him now is to defend his second position from Fernando Alonso, from Lewis Hamilton, maybe even from George Russell. But he should be capable of doing this with Red Bull under his groins. Carlos Sainz is widening the gap with Charles Leclerc. Lance Stroll is finally trying to catch up with the guys, because he definitely should be in this top 8 mix. Then we have two French drivers, two Alpines with a solid performance, and as I told you already, a strong race from Guan Yu Zhou. In Constructors' Championship, Mercedes is P to now. They were pretty close after Monaco and now they move forward. A bad weekend for Ferrari, only one driver in points and the gap between themselves and P3 is widening. Alpine just hold middle ground and Alfa Romeo is catching up with Haas F1 team. This is it. Thank you very much for your view. I hope that you really enjoyed and liked my video. If so, please leave a comment, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel for future F1 analytics. Set and go. I wanna be the greatest. Everybody on the face shit. I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest. I make this every day and I'm impatient. Hoping one day I blow up from the basement. Stay mid. The top is so vacant. I don't need shit that I think is amazing. Waiting for my day when I'm playing. Sold out shows for a thousand faces.